This show contains movie spoilers and swearing. To another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host RJ McCready, and for this episode, we're going to take you back to 1988 to look at Child's Play. And joining me for the show today is Jerry Cortez, aka Mr. Venom, uh, who's a fellow podcaster. Jerry, uh, Mr. Venom, uh, how would you like me to call you today, Mr. Jerry or Mr. Venom? <laughs> Either one is acceptable. Um, greetings and salutations, by the way, listeners and RJ. Very happy to be here. But yeah, I answer to Jerry, Mister Venom, asshole, whatever you want to call me. <laughs> I do. A, I do a combination of the three. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, it's it's like a sort of uh, superhero thing, isn't it? Because I mean, I go by an alias. And it's a bit like that yeah. bit when Spider-Man meets Doctor Strange, isn't it? You know, and he says, "Oh, should we use our real names or should we use our, <laughs> <laughs> our fake names?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, people. That's what we're going to go with today. That's how we're going to start the show off. So it's all good stuff. I like the way it ha- that is happening right now. Um, but tell us a little bit about yourself, Jerry. Um, I know you, you you do several podcasts. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, I've I've been podcasting for about, um, I'd say, six years now. Got my start on the Horror Cast, a show that still exists that I am no longer a part of. Mm-hmm. But at my heaviest, I had 11 podcasts active at one time. Um, it, oh, it's yeah. one of those things that once I started doing it, I just got so addicted to it. Yeah. And on top of the fact that I have a lot of free time, I am married, but I don't have any children. And my wife works nights and weekends. So I, I just have a lot of free time on my hands. And podcasting just filled all that empty space up beautifully and... Uh, to this day, I, I no longer have 11 podcasts because I, I realize that that's kind of spreading yourself a little thin. Mm-hmm. I'm now on a more manageable six shows right now. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy hell, I feel like I've got Ricky Morgan on the show. Hang on a second. He's a, he's a dude that's got 11 podcasts. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I know what you mean. I mean, I've, I've, got, into, I, I've got into podcasting three, three, four years ago now. And that was down to Ricky Morgan from the Helming Power Hour, who invited me onto his show and um, put a mic in front of me. And after that, that's it. And I created Bite Size Cinema, and here we are. So um, Very nice. I, I, I get that. I, I love podcasting, as I've said, but I've said this many times. Um, I love the community, uh, like getting to do this today with yourself. Do you know what I mean? Have fellow podcasters come onto the show, and we get to chat, and we get to talk about crazy things sometimes we might talk about the film that we're we're supposed to (laughs) that's kind of how podcasting goes with the segues and stuff like that (laughs) absolutely i mean for me podcasting has just been incredibly cathartic um Mm. i i don't have any real life horror movie fans like i I work at direct tv so you know a lot of suit and ties and businessmen things like that or a lot of techs who don't really even watch movies let alone horror so yeah podcasting was just an obvious choice for me to just to find people you know like-minded people that i could talk about the genre that i love and you know for the last six years i've just been incredibly happy with it and yeah just like today i mean if it wasn't for you i'd be sitting here probably playing a video game so but instead i get to talk about a great movie so oh, that's happy. fantastic yeah it's funny you say that i've heard that as well through uh fellow podcasters as well uh, particularly Dan Bone from the podcast on Haunted Hill, he said the same thing. He said, mm-hmm. if it wasn't for me talking on the shows, because he talks to Gav and, you know, and he said, on a day to day basis, I don't really talk about horror with people, mm-hmm. but when I come on to, to the shows, it's, it's almost like I release, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I need to talk to some horror. I'm going to get on to my horror community. So. Especially, oh. Exactly. Especially when you see like a new great horror film. It's like, I have to talk to someone about this. God damn it. <laughs> yes. Well, the thing is, uh, Jerry, I, I was like that sort of 20 years ago. Um, mm-hmm. 
I used to go and watch a film, or I still do now, and I'm itching to talk about it, you know. I'll be like in the car driving home, and I'm thinking, let's talk about this, let's talk about that, you know. <laughs> so it's almost like podcasting just seems to be that sort of natural release for me and for yourself by the sound of things. So, oh, yeah. um, But we've got ourselves a bit of a classic today because um, I haven't covered this one on the show, and that is mm-hmm. Child's Play, obviously from 1988. Uh, a movie that just gets more and more silly as it goes along, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, with the sequels. <laughs> but we'll get into that in a minute. So what we'll do, Jerry, is um, we will play a trailer, and then we'll come back and we'll get into this movie. So we'll see you soon, guys. Everyone has a birthday they'll always remember. Can we open my presents now, Mommy? He's something, isn't he? This is Andy's. Time for bed, Andy. Good night, baby. Good night, Aunt Maggie. Good night, Chucky. Everyone knows most accidents happen at home. How did that happen? This is no accident. Andy! I'm Detective Mike Norris. Homicide. Andy! Miss Peterson's dead, Miss Barclay. She fell from the kitchen window. Someone's moved in with the Barclay family. And so has terror. Mommy, I know who was on the counter. Andy! Who, Andy? Chucky. Nobody believes you about Chucky. my hand I, I i oh for god's sake why won't you believe me because i'm sane this is barkley sane and rational no one believes the truth <laughs> or lives to tell it there's nothing nice about murder <laughs> and there's nothing innocent about child's play. And welcome back, everybody. So the synopsis this film is a single mother gives her son a much sought after doll for his birthday only to discover that it is possessed by the soul of a serial killer it's got 6.6 on imbd uh, it was directed by mr tom holland um had a nine million dollar budget and it made a whole ton of money of 44 million so jerry child's play what can you tell me about this film do you like it I no like it. I can't go so far as to say I love it. I'm hmm. the the thing with Chucky movies, Child's Play movies, or killer doll movies in general. Hmm. It's a matter of how you accept a doll as a killer. Is it scary? Is it goofy to you? Um, it, it seems like if you speak to five different horror fans, they'll have five different opinions about killer doll movies. Now. Uh, I I fall into the camp of not being the biggest fan of killer doll movies, and it's weird because if you listen to any of my shows, you know that I tend to interject uh, real-world logic into horror movies, which is something that we really shouldn't do. (laughs) Ultimately, you know, this genre is meant to be taken at face value, you know, turn off your brain, just have a good time, things like that, but yeah, I, I... I definitely tend to think about real world things and killer doll physics has have always been an issue for me how this doll that weighs a couple of pounds is made of plastic is somehow able to take down a full grown adult male it's one of those things that I've always struggled with when I watch these films but ultimately with child's play it's so well written and uh, it's got a great cast that actually Mm. you know keeps you compelled to the point where you kind of forgive a little bit of the inconsistencies like 
you know, uh, Chucky's mother wrestling with the doll, but then suddenly out of nowhere, she's able to throw it across the room. It's like, well, why couldn't you throw it across the room when he first attacked you? Things like that yeah, have sure. always kind of bothered me, you know? So, um, but I'm trying, you know, I, when I watch movies like this, especially going into a film knowing that it's a killer doll film, I know that I have to try, that I have to suspend disbelief and that I have to try to accept what the director is giving me. Um, and, you know, sometimes my logical brain doesn't allow me to do it. Other times it does. With Child's Play, it does, because like I said, there's so many other positives about the film. Uh, you know, Brad Dorff as the voice of Chucky is spectacular. Um, Chucky's attitude as the movie goes along. And even the basic storyline, how it involves voodoo and things like that, I, I do enjoy. So I'm willing to forgive the shortcomings that Child Play has because it does so many other things right. So all in all, I'm positive on the movie, but not nearly, you know, I, I wouldn't like, I, I, it's ultimately, it's a classic objectively, yeah. but it, to me, maybe it's not so much a classic. It's just one of those great 80s time cast capsules that, you know, I go back to every now and again, you know, for, more for nostalgia than anything else. Yeah, no, sure. Um, the thing I picked up on here was it being directed by Tom Holland who obviously did uh, Fright Night a few years before this, and what I thought was quite good to see Chris Sarandon, who obviously played the vampire in Fright mm -hmm. Night, kind of played the hero role in this, and I thought he did it quite well. And I saw a similarity between, uh, obviously, Catherine Hicks is, is kind of like the Jerry Standridge type person in this, who's like trying to make people believe that something, something evil was happening. And obviously in Friday night you've got like a vampire next door and obviously the police and everybody's going, you're crazy, vampires don't exist. And what was interesting was to see actually um, Chris Sarandon almost like play this type of uh, Peter Vincent type role. Where initially mm -hmm. at the beginning he's kind of saying, you're crazy, you know, this is silly, a dull, <laughs> like what you just said, you know, it's like, you know, I can't get into that sort of scientific <laughs> reasoning or whatever um, so I kind of like that and the other thing I like the other thing I saw with this movie it could have gone a different direction in the 80s where you mm -hmm. could have you could have just had it where you didn't see Chucky at all as a doll coming alive and you just had these people getting murdered and killed and the whole film could have just been focused on was it the kid who's killing these um, you know victims um, and then obviously the police investigate, and then you have this big reveal at the end where you find out is the doll that has actually come alive. Um, so it could have gone in different directions, I think. Absolutely. I One of the biggest regrets I have with this film is that they don't do anything with Charles Lee Ray as a human. Mm. I would have liked to have seen at least one scene of him, you know, maybe taking out a victim just to kind of show us his M.O. Was he the type of guy who stalked people for weeks and then attacked or was he a random killer? Like, I would have liked to have known a little bit more about Charles Lee Ray. And then I would have it would have also built up the hatred for the character, because as the movie goes, it opens and he's already being chased by the police it's like i feel like there's a first half of that scene that we're not seeing where maybe charles lee ray just murdered someone and chris sarandon's detective character shows up and then the chase begins or something so i i, I feel like that was a missed opportunity um you, you have a great actor like brad dorf you know available to you you know maybe he was only available for one day so they were only able to get his human form in there for one you know the one scene so you know there, there could be extenuating circumstances that kind of you know uh, dictate why he's not in the film more but I feel personally, um, if we would have seen him kill at least one person early in the film before he makes the transformation, I, I would have found the character a lot easier to hate, if you will. Because ultimately, Chucky is kind of funny. I mean, he has his comedic moments. You know, he's obviously a scumbag. He's a serial killer. You know, no one should be cheering or rooting for him. But ultimately, he comes off as very comedic, and that's charming a lot of the times. You know, the evil person who can still make you laugh. So, uh, but but if we would have seen something with Charles Lee Ray pre transformation yep. or, or you know pre soul swapping, uh, I, I I just feel like it would have driven the point home more and. You know, ultimately, we spend so much time with Andy and his mom in the film. And I'm not necessarily saying that any of those scenes are, you know, filler or wasted because the movie is only it's under 90 minutes. So yeah. it's a quick watch. It gets to the action. At times, the pacing's almost too fast because it's like, 
Like, for one example, as soon as they bring up the voodoo practitioner, literally the next scene, they're going to his house. Like, there was no investigation, no trying to find him. Everything, and then even with Eddie, uh, what was his name? Eddie Caputo's death. It just, everything moves along so quickly Mm -hmm. that this is an example of a film that maybe could have taken its time a little bit more, developed some of these characters more, and then maybe I would have cared more. Uh, you know, when they got taken out or whatever the case may be. Because ultimately, I have no feeling for the voodoo guy. Because we literally meet him, and three minutes later, he's dead. So it's like, well, what the hell? I, I understand the point of the scene, but there's no emotional attachment. So it it really doesn't do anything to the viewer other than show that Chucky is going back and taking out everybody that upset him in his human life. You know? So, eh. yeah, a minor A minor grief, but still... <laughs> yeah, no, you are. I mean, it's a um, a very quick cut movie. It'll be interesting to see how much was actually put onto the cutting room floor. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I think you're right. I never actually, you know what? I never really thought on that before. What you said there with the Charles Lee Ray to actually have an extra yeah. ten minutes, and I think that actually would have worked. Um, I mean, you could have just thrown like literally a three to five minute scene yeah, at the beginning of him. him stalking and killing someone, and bam, yeah. you know, instantly hateable. Or you could have had like a say like a kill scene which kind of mm-hmm. replicates a kill scene that you get later on with the doll. So then I guess as the audience, you can say, oh, okay, yeah, this is Charles Lee Ray because he did that at the beginning of the movie with exactly. a victim. Yeah, no, that's good. You know what? I never actually thought of that before, but that's pretty good. <laughs> I only thought about that uh, on my watch this week. I, I, I've never really thought about it. I, I, admittedly, I haven't watched this film in probably uh, 15, 16 years. So watching it this week, I, I just literally was like, man, I would have loved to have seen... Because I do enjoy Brad Dorf. I, I think he's a spectacular actor. Yeah. You know, I, um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, literally one of the best performances ever. Him mm-hmm. and Jack Nicholson together are absolute gold. So I would have liked to have seen more of Brad in the film. It's great that we get his voice through the whole film. You know, I'm not necessarily complaining about that, but... Yeah, I, I just personally would have liked to have seen, you know, the actual serial killer, Charles E. Ray, at work. I'm sure when Tom Hill Holland listens to this episode, Jerry, he's going to be hitting himself. <laughs> do you know what I mean? He's going to be going, damn, I knew I should have done that. Oh, shit, why did I not do that? He's going to be frying stuff. Oh, damn. <laughs> oh, I don't realise that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, I think it's yeah, I think it's a solid movie. Um, I think it's a film that kind of, I think out of the whole sort of series, I think this one's probably the more for me, it's the most solid one because um, mm-hmm. as it goes along, and I think the other films, especially when you start getting to like the seeded Chuck, it starts getting a bit silly. Um, it, it, yeah. it, I think what it does is it kind of harms the original because it, when I, I watched this when I was about nine or ten years old with a friend of mine mm-hmm. um, on VHS and it scared the shit out of me to be honest with you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't like dolls anyway. Uh, my, my nan used to have a a house for the dolls and it used to scare the shit out of me because I found it something creepy anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I did get a little bit of cinema trauma out of this film, but um, when I like revisit this original, because I know how ridiculous the next ones are, it kind of just takes it away now. It's... Uh, you know yeah, I, mean? I look at this film the same way I kind of look at the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, where the original Nightmare on Elm Street went for more dark and grim storytelling, and then after that, it, it just turned into, you know, Freddy Krueger becomes a stand-up comedian, which is cool, don't get me wrong, I'm not necessarily complaining, but I, you know, the, the original is my favorite because it's the one that's just so dark and gritty, and Freddy actually comes off as terrifying, and you can you can say the same thing about this one. Chucky, to me, has only ever been terrifying in the original. Everyone after that, it's just kind of... It's more of a novelty than anything else. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, would you would you say that this is kind of like... that? This one sort of stands on a pedestal? When people think of a, a doll in the horror genre, generally sort of go, yeah, Chucky. Because I was trying to think of something... Uh, I know we got Annabelle, obviously, today, but around about this sort of period, I don't think we had any other movies, did we? I think films may have ripped this I one I mean, off. we had... Yeah, we had individual movies, you know, like Dolly Dearest Dolly and Dearest, uh, Anthony yeah. Hopkins' Magic. 
Hmm. You know, so we did have some killer doll movies, but because this seems this and Puppet Master are really the only ones I can think of that became a franchise. Yes. Um, uh, obviously, other than Annabelle nowadays. But with Annabelle, I look at Annabelle a little bit differently because Annabelle is not really a killer doll. The doll itself doesn't do any of the killing. Annabelle is a conduit for the demon that's attached to it. Hmm. It's the demon that's doing the killing. Annabelle's just there for decoration. So. Um, I mean, you know, it, it still has the DNA of a killer doll movie because, you know, obviously the main visual antagonist is the doll. But, you know, I, I still don't necessarily have Annabelle on the same level as like a child's play or, you know, a puppet master, you know, where, where it's the actual toys that are committing the crimes. Yeah, yeah. It's because um, did um, the puppet master, was that before this or did it come out afterwards? I'm trying to think. Now. I think the first oh that's a good question i'm not sure i'm not as up on puppet master as i should be considering there's like what 12 or 13 of those movies hang on a second i've let probably me, seen let me give duncan <laughs> McCl McCleish a quick call hang on <laughs> so <I'll skim>. <laughs> <laughs> let's get a direct I've doll like maybe, <laughs> i've probably seen like half of the puppet master movies um like i said the killer doll genre isn't something that i gravitate towards no. i am a fan of supernatural but but when it comes to the killer dolls, like I said, because of the whole physics of it, it always kind of just comes off as kind of funny to me. Like even something like Krampus, which is more modern, like the gingerbread men and the teddy bears <laughs> in Krampus, I, I still have issues with the doll physics of it all. So, yeah. you know, it, it's just me interjecting logic into a movie that shouldn't have any logic interjected into it but yeah. it's just kind of the way i've always been you know i look at things logically and as much as i love out there crazy nutty horror films that make no sense whatsoever um i still every every now and again do like a a horror film that makes me think yeah, and makes yeah, me yeah, you know yeah, yeah. think more deeply about what's happening than just the surface level and even in this movie which is basically a killer doll movie there is some commentary in here you know about classism and things like that so i mean there's still more to scratch under the surface with this one yeah because that comes to the next question where later on were you saying you know the mechanics of the doll is in the seed of chucky this guy ends up having sex <laughs> it's yeah. quite a funny scene isn't it where she goes shouldn't you put a rubber on he's like honey i am made of rubber <laughs> he's like what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, there's there's some other things in this as well, which is typical '80s with the police officers. I quite liked um, Chris Sarandon's sort of sidekick. He's very sort of stereotypical '80s cop. Yeah. He's got his, I think he's got like a little bit of an '80s ponytail, isn't he? He's, it's almost like he's off his head on some some sort of narcotic drug most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I say he's definitely a fan of Miami Vice. I was going to say that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like the way he's just so chilled out about everything, you know, and just sort of strolling along. A little along. too chill, honestly. Yeah, for, I mean, for a cop. Yeah, I thought that was it. <laughs> yeah, there was multiple moments in this film where I'm just like, you're not even doing your job. Like, no. it's one thing to be cynical and to, you know, to hear this crazy person say that a doll came to life and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, at the same time, why would you let that person away? If you don't believe that there's a killer doll, then that means that there's some kind of psychotic break mm. with the person telling you this. So why would you just send them on their merry way, especially when their son is currently being accused of murder? So yeah, his character is kind of odd. He's entertaining. I do enjoy Chris Sarandon. But it, man, does he... And it's kind of weird, too, because with the mom not believing Andy first, it's almost poetic justice that the police then in turn don't believe her after she sees Chucky come to life. But it's just one of those, you know, uh, you know, it's horror trope number 327. Adults not believing children and not believing crazy stories from other adults. It's like... It, it, this it's not as infuriating in this movie because these two people don't have a relationship you know the detective and and uh, andy's mom but in films where the characters have a relationship like a married couple and the wife says you know i i, I think I, our house is haunted or i think someone is stalking me and then the spouse is always like oh you're just crazy or oh you're just seeing things that's when it gets infuriating to me when adults don't believe other adults listen folks I've been married to Mrs. Venom for 26 years now. Mm. If she were to come into my house and say that Satan came out of our <laughs> oven 
and attacked her with a pitchfork, I am going to be the first one to say, pack up, let's go. She has, <laughs> she's my wife. She has no reason to lie to me, no reason to make up stories. So, yeah, that, that's part of what marriage is, is unconditional belief. Mm. And so, like I said, when it's a spouse in a horror movie, it bothers me a lot more. But in this case, it's a detective not believing, you know, someone who he's investigating. <laughs> but I still yeah. feel like and, and he does make up for it multiple times when he follows her to Skid Row you know, after saying, you know, th th that he was going home and that he was done for the night, I I'll give him points for that. And then when he did that again a second time, uh, but decided instead of going home, going back to the office and pulling Charles Lee Ray's folder, it's like, I appreciate the fact that he's making an effort, but let the mother know that you're making this effort because she thinks that you're ignoring her completely. So there's just a lot of misunderstandings and disbelief in this film that, like I said, it's just another horror trope that we have to deal with. Since it's a 1988 movie, of course, I'm a lot more forgiving of that. Whereas if it was a 2021 movie, I would pan it straight to hell. <laughs> See, I want to go back to you saying that Satan's coming out of your oven. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the first thing I thought of. I, mean, I was going to yeah. say gonna say monkeys flying through the window, but a <laughs> Satan coming out of the oven sounds kind of funny, too. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, that, that's a movie, isn't it? You know, that's something we'll I'd see on it. screen, you know, Satan in the oven. <laughs> hey, I mean, if Ghostbusters gave us Vigo, or not Vigo, but uh, the Carpathian inside of a refrigerator, I think Satan in the oven is very doable. <laughs> <laughs> I got my oven up to 666 degrees and he turned up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should be writing this stuff down. <laughs> well, there we go. There you go. If anybody listening and want to turn it into a movie, you never yeah, know. Yeah, yeah patent pending. Don't uh, steal my design. I liked that, Jerry. That's probably like the highlight of this. You know, I don't think we need to say any more. That's it, guys. That's the end of the show. <laughs> but we've got to where we needed to get to. I mean, <laughs> can't do any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens in podcasting, man. This is what I was talking about, you know. It's like oh, tangents are the best. Yeah, oh, this is it, it, yeah. crazier the tangent, the more entertaining it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about that movie instead, shall we? <laughs> the one that hasn't been oh. created. Just <laughs> I'm wondering how they end it. Do they freeze? Do they put Satan in the freezer as like the opposite effect, and then they defeat him that way? Or hmm, how do you uh. beat Satan in the oven? <laughs> We'll just do the whole, you know, thing he was talking about where the wife tries to convince the husband and the husband says, no, I don't believe you. I'm just going to go and take a shower first. Exactly. We don't worry yeah, about just, that, you know. You know you're, you're just having hormone issues. Or you're, just, you're just seeing things. It's like, that, that's just, it's just so frustrating to me. When it, Ultimately, when it's a new marriage, like Paranormal Activity, where Micah and his wife weren't really married that long, it was a new marriage, It's a, you know, it's a little bit more understandable but it's like once they come to you a second time and say, hey, I think there's something in our house, uh, you have no reason not to believe your spouse mm. at all. Yeah. And ultimately, even if, it, even if it is in her head, at least humor her. You know, you didn't spend all this time married to this woman so you could abandon her as soon as she says something nutty. That, that's just dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we get that scene at the end of the movie as well where they're trying to kill Chucky so he gets burnt up and he comes back all gooey and he's running about which was uh, which was pretty cool and it was something which I thought, I've seen this before which was kind of like mimicked later on in the movie which was the arachnophobia movie. Mm -hmm. It just felt to me as if in, when they're trying to kill that spider at the end he's trying to burn it and he's trying to poke it and he's trying to shoot it and they're trying to do everything <laughs> they can to it, you know what I mean? It's all right. Yeah, so... Yep. Uh, how the hell... <laughs> and as you said, um, as time is going on, there's that little bit that the voodoo master came out and said, and I think you're right, we could have done with a little bit more time with him, where he said yeah. that the longer the, you're in this vessel, you're going to turn into like a human. So you're eventually going to turn, become real. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, go also, <laughs> uh, this is a public service announcement, folks. If you practice voodoo, please do not have a voodoo doll of yourself. That just makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> Why would yeah, you do that's that? It. I, I mean, unless, unless somebody else made the voodoo doll and you stole it from them i mean which i don't know put it in a safety deposit box it just it doesn't make sense that something that could kill you 
is like right there in view of everyone who comes into your house. Uh, well, no, this no. is a this is a good discussion point of that scene right there. I've got a voodoo doll, and it can kill me. And guess what? I'm going to tell Charles Lee Ray, who's a serial killer, <laughs> exactly where it is. Because every you, you know, because that's what they do. You know, if you want to double cross me sometime, mate. Just go in this drawer. It's the one right at the bottom, right at the back. There's a little drawer. You just open it up, and there's a doll of me. You can snap me into little bits. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Just yeah, like I said, the, the 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 sense. I love the scene. Don't get me wrong. Overall, I think the voodoo uh, doll scene is one of the better scenes in the film. Mm. Uh, you know, it's definitely one of the more painful scenes in the film. But um, yeah, like I said, just the whole logic of having that doll and then telling a serial killer where you keep it. Eh, <laughs> I have to. I have to question his judgment a little bit. <laughs> uh, what do you think of the special effects in this film? Um, I, I think what up. few special effects are here aren't bad. I like that they took the time to make so many different versions of the Chucky doll. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of when Chucky is actually the full actor in the suit walking around. Though I will give the uh, the production credit because they realized that the actor in the Chucky suit was 33% larger than the actual good guy's doll that was being used throughout the movie. So what they actually did was they created sets that had furniture and other fixtures that were 33% larger. Oh, right, so okay. Whenever you see those scenes of Chucky and it's actually the human actor in the suit and they're walking around, they're walking around in an enlarged set to make the effect of the walking doll look more realistic. Uh -huh. So I, I give him credit for that. It's not always perfect because there are still scenes where, especially the scene outside of the um, mental facility where they take Andy and we see Chucky going up the stairs. It's like, that looks like a four foot adult. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. look like a two foot doll, but you know, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll accept it. <laughs> honey, I shrunk the kids. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honey, I shrunk the evil serial killer. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> I will say, I will say that the electrocution effects were pretty cool. Not that it really makes sense that in in 1988 uh, a me a children's mental facility would actually have. Um, you know, th that kind of electrocution equipment there. Um, yeah. But whatever. And the fact that it's strong enough to actually kill a human is a little bit of a suspension of disbelief as well. But I'm just commenting on the effects. I like the way it looks when he starts to bleed from the eyes and the mouth. Uh, it just looks really cool. And for whatever it's worth, I actually have seen some real life pictures of people that have been electrocuted. And though most of them are a little bit crispier than our friend in this film, you know, hit once he gets to his final form. I have seen people that have been mildly electrocuted that actually do look like that. So kudos to the filmmakers for uh, making it look somewhat realistic. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's how Tom Savini did all his effects, wasn't it? Because of his tour in Vietnam, wasn't it? You know, he, exactly. with all his zombies and stuff, he made it as more realistic. I think it was like a bit of a turning point in the special effects world where he's kind of like, let's try and make this stuff look real with what, what we've actually experienced. Um, but yeah, no, on the whole, I think it's um, a solid movie. It's kind of left on a little bit of a cliffhanger at the end, isn't it? Which... Yeah. kind of makes you think whether the kid's been possessed a little bit or something like that because he sort of looks around doesn't he and, and yeah actually it. the first time i watched this film i thought that charles lee ray somehow successfully got into andy because of that final kind of shot of andy there but that's not the case so no okay no but i did <laughs> I, I, I did that myself uh, when i watched this at 10 years old when i was watching it with my friends we did actually have that discussion of how this could turn out, you know, um, uh -huh. in the end. Um, but yeah, it's only a, a talking point. It's like I say, it's a fun, it's a fun movie. It's a good addition from um, Tom Holland. Uh, I kind of like it with his other movies that he's done with, um, like say, Fright Night. You can certainly see the special effects that are taken from that film that kind of intertwine with this as well. Um, yep. But like I say, it's good to see Chris Sarandon play a different role. He seems quite charming. The only thing I would say is diff that's missing from him is that blue jumper which he wears in the nightclub in Fright Night. So it would have been good to see that <laughs> as an Easter egg. 
for a movie filled with easter eggs too there's actually a lot of easter eggs in this movie hmm. you know right from how charles lee ray gets his name which i would assume most child's play historians are already aware of but if you're not the charles comes from charles manson the lee comes from lee harvey oswald who assassinated uh john f kennedy and then uh the lee come or no not the lee the ray comes from james earl ray the man who assassinated martin luther king so oh, wow i don't know i don't know if that's a cool fact or a morbid one that they decided to take three real life serial killers slash assassins to make the name of our antagonist in this film but hey you know that's pretty cool it's something yeah, absolutely. That's, that's... But I mean, yeah, massive Easter eggs in this movie. Like, did you notice uh, when the Child's Play title card comes up, uh, the whole thing is in capital letters except for the I in Child and the A in Play? No, AI. I didn't see that. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the only two letters. It's almost like they left a secret message for anyone who ever wanted to remake the movie and say, here, this is here's your here's your concept, AI. And, hmm, someone did that in 2019. Go figure. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a bit spooky, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those Simpsons predicting the future type things that, you know, I, I whether there's any validity to it or not, obviously, is up to, you know, the person hearing the information. But I just find it's one of those things that I find kind of fascinating. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Chucky in the horror genre is just one of those characters like you mentioned earlier with... Um, like Jason Voorhees and uh, Freddy Krueger. I think he's just one of those characters that just... I think he's always going to be there in some shape or form. It's always going to be sort of remade. And um, I think there's always that sort of curiosity with this character because it, it kind of makes money, doesn't it? And uh, I suppose... I don't know if you're going to get to that point where you're just going to run out of ideas, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's. Uh, I don't know what you well, think. Well, I mean, you know... It, it, I, I, every excuse me, I'm choking on my own words. Mm -hmm. Every horror franchise kind of reaches that state where it, it's kind of stagnant, you know, where they feel like they're just kind of doing the same thing over and over again, and then they have their, you know, weird moment. Friday the Thirteenth had Jason versus Carrie, you know, Freddy had, you know, the new nightmare coming out into the real world. Uh, you know, so, you know, every franchise kind of, or or you could just be Halloween and just forget about the last three sequels and <laughs> start over again. Like they've done three times or twice yeah. already. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, ultimately, I, I do believe that every franchise kind of hits that wall. I don't know that Child's Play is there yet because of the of the actual Don Mancini Child's Play movies, I actually enjoyed Cult of Chucky. It's a cheesy movie. I will never say that it's quote unquote good. It's got some terrible dialogue, but I it's a guilty pleasure movie for me. Like I, I think the kills are really, really well done. I think the scene with all the multiple Chuckies towards the end of the movie is actually really entertaining. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I like I said, I'm kind of indifferent to the franchise, but the original and the last one, I will say I am a fan of. Like I, Those are the only two Child's Play movies I actually own, yeah. is the original and then uh, Cult of Chucky. Um, and honestly, I haven't seen them all. I'll be 100% honest. I don't know if I've seen Bride of Chucky. I've seen, I know I've seen Seed, um, but I'm not 100% I've seen Bride. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that kind of goes with almost every horror franchise. It's one of those things where, you know, just because it's a big horror franchise, it, it, it doesn't give me the initial interest to go in and watch every single one of them. It's like once I get to a chapter that I don't like, I tend to stop there. Like to this day, I haven't seen Halloween 6 because of how much I hated Halloween 5. I, I gave H2O and Resurrection a chance, and obviously I, I regret that decision greatly. But, you know, once I saw five, I had no interest in seeing Halloween six. And to this day, I still don't think I've seen it. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm the same <laughs> with the horror, um, these horror genres. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Friday uh, Friday the 13th part six fan. I'm mm -hmm. a, um, Freddy Krueger, the Dream Warriors, I would say, is my go to. And in, in, nice. this, in, this, in this case, is the first movie. 
And I'm mm-hmm. the same as you. I haven't, I haven't seen all the Chucky movies because I've just looked at the cover and I thought, nah, I can tell straight away. I've seen enough films to go, mm, <laughs> I'm not sure about yeah, exactly. it. You know what I mean? And <laughs> now, obviously, now as a podcaster, I'll watch whatever I'm tasked with watching. Yeah. You know, if somebody yeah, wants yeah, yeah. to watch Halloween 6 for a show, I'll watch it. But when it came to before my podcasting years, I needed to have some kind of an, in- an initial interest in the film. You know, you could tell me that you know a certain film is the greatest thing you've ever seen it doesn't mean it's gonna get me to go watch it i have to care in some way shape or form either about like a director a writer someone in the movie the basic storyline whatever the case may be um i mean to this day i've never seen titanic for example and i have so many caucasians in my life telling me that it's the greatest movie ever made it doesn't matter i don't really care that much you know i'm sure it's a great film i'm not gonna deny it but I, I don't really feel the need to invest two and a half hours in, in a movie that, you know, eh, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's a terrible thing to say, but I would almost rather watch something awful like a Sleepaway Camp 4 or something <laughs> a, as opposed to watching a new drama that's like, you know, critically acclaimed and award winning and everything else. So, yeah, yeah I, 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 I have to have interest in the film. I'm the same. I, I am that character with three doors in front of me first door is a new movie that's just come out that everybody's talking about and then the second door is a load of films that my friends have recommended to me and then the third do- door is the films I've watched about a hundred times and I'm kicking that third door you know it's like <laughs> give me that the majority of us would go that way yeah, yeah. I mean it's a, there's a reason they call it comfort food my friends it, it, it is, makes us happy it is definitely comfort comfort food I'm always going for Return of the Living Dead all day long, something like that. I can just get, sink my That's teeth funny, into. I just, I just referenced that the other day in the exact type of conversation. Oh, where really? I was actually getting into a little bit of an argument. Not an argument, but a little bit of a discussion with my wife because she's not a big fan of emotional horror films. Like, mm. when she watches a horror film, she wants it to be Return of the Living Dead or a Friday the 13th movie or something like that, yeah. as opposed to, say, the Child's Play remake, where she was actually mad at me because she's like, I actually care about this doll now, you know? It's not the doll's fault that he's going around killing all these people. And, and it's like, well, honey, isn't that a good thing? Isn't isn't it a great thing that a horror movie, a movie that's supposed to be just mindless entertainment, can actually make you think and feel something? Feel something for both sides too, the antagonist and the protagonist. Yeah, it's true. like you feel yeah. equally bad for both of them. To me, that's a good thing. That's a director doing his job. But I also understand her mentality of, you know, I'd rather watch Sleepaway Camp three than Hereditary. You know, yeah, that's her that's mentality. Right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. If, that, if that's your mentality, that's fine. I myself. <laughs> prefer you know some of the modern masterpieces you know i mean don't get me wrong i love my friday the 13th it's my favorite franchise but on any given day i'd rather watch you know martyrs or hereditary or get out or something like that as opposed to you know friday the 13th part seven you know for the 300th time yeah yeah no i'm the same i'm a massive I I think you mentioned earlier it's comfort food isn't it really you know I go back to it I know that film's going to make me feel good or you know nostalgic or whatever and yeah that's why we do it so um, yeah right Jerry well on that note um, is there anything more you want to talk about Charles Play? I think we pretty much covered everything here with this dude, don't we? <laughs> this rubber rubber carrot yeah. that runs around, starts kidding everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think I've pretty much said my piece. I, you know, th- there's some more logic things that kind of bother me about the movie, but again, it's a killer doll movie, so yeah. who the hell am I to try to, you know, interject logic into it? But some of the some of the like more deeply hidden easter eggs in the movie i do kind of enjoy uh i mentioned the ai in the title card uh the local tv station uh in that town is wdol doll oh right <laughs> like, oh wow that, I that, I, that, that's like so unnecessary that it's entertaining like there was no reason <laughs> for them to do that but it's like okay because it's not like the whole town is affected by this <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, what the hell? We'll throw it in there. It's like okay. oh. the last thing. <laughs> I was going to say it's an old fuck off moment. What the fuck are you doing there with that? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's the director flipping off the audience, saying, "Take it or leave it." Seriously. But that's 
uh, the last one, though, I, that I kind of like, too, that a lot of people don't realize. Throughout the film, inside of Andy's apartment, there are pictures of a man in a red shirt. Now, most of us would assume that that's, you know, Andy's dad, who's not in the picture for one reason or another. I don't, I don't know if we get an exact reason, but whatever. Um, but the man in those pictures is actually director Tom Holland. Oh, is it? Oh, uh, right, okay. Yeah, he's wearing a red shirt. I think they show the picture two or three times in the film. At one point, it's on the mantle in the living room, but then at another point, it's on like an end table uh, in that same room. But yeah, that's actually Tom Holland. The picture's never in focus. It's always in the background, yeah. but you can see the red shirt. And yeah, that's Tom Holland. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Every damn director's got to get themselves in their movies somehow. They could do their little cameos, haven't they? You know? Yeah, Just... I, I blame Hitchcock for that one. <laughs> just, just like John Carpenter in the fog, eh? Can I get paid now, can Father? Get, <laughs> can, I, can I get my second paycheck now? Yeah. I acted. Actually, <laughs> come in a couple of hours later tomorrow. <laughs> okay, cheers. There <laughs> and there you go. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've made my John Carpenter reference. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, got, no. I've got Chuck <laughs> JC in there. It's my John Carpenter Easter egg I mean, chucked my... in. Hmm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, my final thoughts on Child's Play are, you know, in my personal opinion, it's, you know, it's not necessarily, like, up there with, like, the huge genres, the Fridays, the Nightmares, the, the Halloweens, things like that. But it is a guilty pleasure. I can see why so many people enjoy this franchise. And, and myself, even, there are chapters of this franchise that I do really enjoy, as I already mentioned. But with this original, I do return to it, maybe not as often as I should, because like I said, I hadn't watched it in well over 10 years, but um, still had a really good time with it. Like I said, it's under 90 minutes. It's a quick watch. It's entertaining. It's funny. You know, the kills may not be as visceral in this film as we maybe would like them to be, but ultimately, you know, we get what we need. And, you know, Brad Dorf just makes the movie, at, at both as Charles E. Ray and as the voice of Chucky. I mean, it, it's his movie more than anyone's. This isn't Andy's movie, and it's definitely not Andy's mother or the detective's movie. It is Chucky's movie. And I think it benefits from that. They, they, they didn't utilize Brad Dorf as much as they could have uh, in human form, but the fact that we still get his iconic voice... And, you know, all of his great, you know, witty one-liners, it, it, it's just, it's really entertaining. So, I, I would definitely give this a moderately high rating, but, I mean, this isn't like a 9 out of 10 or anything to me necessarily, but it's still, as I've already said, it's comfort food, it's entertaining, you know what you're going to get, and it's a quick watch. So, yeah, uh, I, I, am a, a, I am a fan. Yeah, no, well, like I say, I hold some nostalgia with this film because it takes me back to the sort of late 80s when I first watched it and uh, I'll certainly give it seven unused Chucky batteries that are still in their pack and uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah that's probably right where I fall to yeah about a seven <laughs> <laughs> I mean hey oh, it's still a good score ultimately like I, it, yeah to me a seven is still very watchable and probably entertaining and it's probably if, if average people give it about a seven, because it, it sits at a six point six on IMDb right now, and that me with ninety five thousand reviews, so that that's probably going to be pretty positive. Yes, yeah, uh, by just looking at IMDb. So, I mean, it, it seems like most people regard it really pretty highly and deservedly so. Um, like I said, it's not a cinematic masterpiece to me, but it is. Um, it is comfort food, and sometimes that's all you want. Oh, yeah, that's it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, Jerry, well, thank you for that today. Thanks for coming on to the show to talk about the rubber man. <laughs> <laughs> Plastic and wire. Oh, dear. <laughs> so, um, before we wrap the show up, Jerry, what have you got coming up? You got anything coming up with uh, your shows? Um, Yes, um, a, a new episode of No More Room in Hell. That's my main podcast. Uh, episode number 39 just dropped this week. We looked at a couple of under-discussed witch movies for what was supposed to be our Halloween episode, but ended up getting released the day after Halloween. But the films we looked at on that episode were 1972's Season of the Witch by George A. Romero, and then 2013's Witching and Bitching by Alex de la Iglesias, uh, two just you know, under-discussed, under-appreciated witch movies that we wanted to bring to the forefront. And um, 
I think we had a really good time with it. It's a quick show. It's probably one of our shortest shows because we recorded it on Halloween weekend. And unfortunately, you know, I, I tend to celebrate Halloween quite excessively. So I may <laughs> mentally, I may not have all been there, but it still is <laughs> a pretty fun show. Uh, and then the side pass, for No More Room in Hell. Uh, one is called Fresh Cuts. That is our weekly show where we review the newest movies in the genre. Our last episode was about uh, Antlers, and the episode that will drop tomorrow, actually, on Monday, November 8th, we'll look at Last Night in Soho, which, spoiler alert, oh, I loved. Great. Yeah, that's it. It's <laughs> the uh, new Edgar Wright movie, isn't it? Um, he... Exactly. I am a big Edgar Wright fan. So um, am I. Even so when am he... I, yeah. No, absolutely. And this movie is just so visually stunning. Jesus, I could sit here for an hour and talk about last night in Soho, but obviously that's a discussion for another show. That is the latest, that'll be the new episode of Fresh Cuts. Like I said, that'll be released sometime later this week. And then the other side cast for No More Room in Hell is called Creature Comforts. That is a creature feature podcast that we just started. We only have two episodes out right now. Episode one looks at the granddaddy of them all, 1933's King Kong. Mm -hmm. Episode two takes a look at 1941's The Wolfman. That was our October slash Halloween episode. And then I can announce episode three will actually be recording next week. We're going to be looking at 1954's Them, looking at some giant radioactive ants. ants and we'll yeah, also have movie. our first... Yeah. I uh, will also have our first guest on that episode, which will be Bo Ransdell hey! from the Dark Parade. Hey! It's always good time, Bo. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Love Bo. Always brings uh, lots of great information to the shows and his opinions. And what, what a stellar voice, too. So, I yeah. said I said this to Bo. I said, Bo, I could listen to you all day long. If I, if I had tr trouble trying to sleep at night, I'd have to phone Bo up and Bo say, Bo, can you just talk to me? Just pick up a, a recipe book and just read out the recipe for making an apple pie. And uh, I'll see if I'm trying to try settle off to sleep, please. <laughs> no, that's valid. I, absolutely. There's some, there's some voices out there that are so <clears throat> soothing. Yeah. And yeah, Bo definitely has one of them. I said he's got some sort of uh, conjured up mic. <laughs> it just makes his voice sound <laughs> sexy or something like that, you know what I mean? So. Oh, man. That would be hysterical, though, if I ever met him in real life and he's like, Hi, Mr. Venom, how you do? Yeah, hey, I'm Bo. One second. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Let me put on my voice. Hang on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so those are, those are three, uh, sorry, those are my three No More Room in Hell podcasts. Yeah. And my other three podcasts, real quick, are In the Mic of Madness, um, it's not horror okay, which of course, as the title indicates, is not a horror podcast. And then my last podcast is called Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space with Jerry Herring. Yeah. That podcast is, of course, you know, a kaiju podcast, Japanese monsters, all that wonderful stuff. So on our latest episode, we look at Gamera versus Baragon. And then I think on our next episode, we're going to be looking at Godzilla Final Wars, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, that's my six shows, brother. Fantastic, man. That's right, because I, I remember texting you thinking you was Jerry Harry once, and you got back to me and said you got the wrong one. I'm Mr. Venom. Yep. Hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a ginger. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great stuff. Well, it's been fantastic having you on the show today, Jerry. Do you know what I mean? I've had a whole ton of fun. Um, I think our pinnacle moment here was Satan in an oven. Do you know what I mean? I'm never going to see it. I'm never going to look at another oven again now and just sort of get that out of my head. <laughs> there you go. There well, you go. I'm glad I was a glad i was able to add uh you know a concept to the vernacular and now everyone is aware of satan in the oven so oh, yeah. yeah beware of your ovens people damn well blew it out <laughs> well blew out the oven wall, wall away man. that's too cliche fucking hell right. <laughs> <laughs> okay people well there you go i hope um you enjoyed that episode as much as i did having jerry on the show um let me do a little bit of admin for the show i'm a proud member of the legion podcast network so go and please check out all the other shows on there we've been busy throughout the month of october so there's a whole ton of shows to go and listen to um i've also got another show which is the mystery vault podcast so go and check that out as well um you can find bite size cinema on facebook got a facebook page on there that's where i'm most active so if there's anything you want me to review let me let me know um, what's coming up next? Well, I've got a, another special episode coming up. I've got a makeup artist coming onto the show. 
um, Mr. Alan A. A. Pone, and he's going to be telling me about all his works in Hollywood with uh, lots of different movies and stuff like that. So that's coming up next. Um, so there you go, guys. Um, oh, yeah, the other important thing is where you can listen to the show. It's on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and several other uh, platforms if you put in Bite Size Cinema Podcast into Google. So there you go. Uh, keep it bite size, keep it safe, and I'll. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.